Hello everybody, thank you all for tuning in to my little talk today. It's very exciting, um, it's got a lot more interest than I thought it would. I am looking wonderfully historically, I hope you can tell, I even did my nails for it. Um, but basically, I've uh, put this together quite quickly over the past week, so I hope it all goes well and you'll all either learn something or at least find something a little bit interesting. First of all, um, if people are watching, feel free to comment, tell me um, who's watching, how you are, send them like little emojis and all that lot, let me know. Um, some people are commenting already. I am following, but on the Queer History Warwick page feed only, so if you want comments or you want me to read anything from that, please do jump on there. So, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is IB Profane. I'm so called because I'm cheap generic and you can find for sale in the corner of most good markets. <laughs> I've just started an Instagram um, at IB Profane, so feel free to follow me and I hope to be posting a look every week or two, particularly during the corona sort of lockdown because it's driving me insane otherwise. I hope we're all not crawling the walls as well. Whilst I'm here, I said there may be a guest spot for my dog Mia, who goes by Mia Culper. I have to basically... Mia! There we are. I had to basically bribe her with treats to get her to come over so she can say hello. There you are, Mia. I'll just bring her up now. <gasps> there she is. Um, I had to wake her up and she's very grumpy about it, I'll have you know. Um, but yes, I was going to make her a rough. That was a pun. Um, but she didn't really want that much, so um, she basically, I'm just going to let her go do her little thing. And oh, she'll be in the room, so you'll probably hear her clattering about as well at the same time. Anyway, my boy name is Nick Cherryman, and I'm a postgraduate student at on a PhD student at Warwick. I'm doing an MA training year before rolling into my first year proper. Um, I look at drag, feminist and queer theory, and I won't bore you with all the details, but basically I look at drag. Um, and if you fancy knowing more, feel free to ask in the comments. Um, there'll be a bit of a Q&A afterwards. Um, so like I said, if you want to reach out to me, the feed I'm following is on Queer History Warwick, so do jump on that, and feel free to leave any comments or questions there. Um, there is a bit of a delay between what I'm saying and what you're seeing, so I won't be able to answer questions as we go, but I will swing back at the end and do it that way. Um, whilst you're on the page, do give Queer History Warwick a like. Um, I help run that group and it'd be lovely to see you all follow us. Um, we try and post something at least once a day, so there'll always be something... Oh, get my corset sorted. Oh, there'll always be something you can look at, hopefully. And if you want to contribute, do give us a shout, and we'll have a talk and we'll see if we can do something for you. Um, oh, someone just said I'm gorgeous. That's wonderful. Mm, thank you, Damien. So, I appreciate I've nattered away for a little bit. Um, so, to start off with, I'd love to get you sort of thinking about what drag it is and isn't. Feel free to comment if you want. Um... But where I'm going to come from this is, whilst drag means something different to every person, there's a couple of things I want to be really clear about what drag is not. So, first of all, drag is not the same as trans. Um, and that doesn't mean, though, when I say that, that someone who is trans can't do drag, or someone who does drag can't be trans. But I think it's super important to make it clear that they don't mean the same thing any more than, say, having a size 10 shoe and a purple car are the same things. I mean, you might have a size 10 shoe, you might have a purple car, but let's face it, I mean, first of all, you on the colour of the car. But secondly, they don't mean the same thing. Um, it's also not something that exists or comes about in um, just Europe and the US. Um, it's much more than that. Um, although most of what we see today is very Anglo-centric. Um, that said, most of what I'll be talking about will be from there, um, only because that's just what I know most about. Um, but there is a whole sort of breadth outside of that. Um, it's also, I know I'm listening a lot, um, this is the Queen's speech we wish we heard on Sunday, I love it. Um, it's also not just a man um, dressing as a woman. There is a rich history of drag, and although men dressing as women, or whatever this is, um, is the most well known. There are things such as drag kings, um, bio queens, bio kings, non-binary drag, non-binary people doing drag. There's a whole host there. It's not just 
that, basically. And finally, I want to say, um, in terms of what it isn't, there's a lot of terminology around gender that's really difficult to negotiate, um, and particularly in these kinds of talks. Basically, the term drag has meant different things over the years, and it often gets merged and mixed up with things that aren't necessarily drag. And I'll sort of touch on this lightly later on, um, in particular when I start talking about Stonewall, there's a little bit of a, something coming up. Um, but basically, drag, or any term, as it were, can't just be lifted up and placed in the past historically, because it just doesn't mean the same thing, and people have different conceptions of it in the past. Finally, finally, this is finally, um, I also want to point out that for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm defining drag as when someone puts on some sort of marker to uh, signify or exaggerate gender in like a really conscious way. And often that's through clothing or makeup. And by that I mean like it's a super deliberate performance of gender, um, above and beyond say just someone putting on uh, like a dress because they feel like it that day. Um, anyway, there's a lot to cover, so I'm gonna get going. Um, I'll be moving at quite a pace. Um, we'll start off quite broad, but as it goes on, it will narrow more and more down into more specific examples. Um, so do uh, do listen in and let me know. It should go on for about 35 minutes, and then a bit of a Q&A afterwards. So, first of all, we're going to go all the way back to ancient Egypt, to pharaohs. So basically they ruled for about 3,000 odd years, from about 3,150 BC to about 30 BC, basically about 5,000 years ago. Um, to about 2,000 years ago. As you probably know, pharaohs basically were the kings of Egypt. And I use that term quite specifically, um, king, because there was no real conception of queen as a ruler, as we might talk about it now. Um, the closest thing you might have to a queen back in ancient Egypt was something that basically meant king's wife. However, and this is where it gets really interesting, we did have female pharaohs, but probably the best thing we would have called them in terms of if we were sort of giving them a modern terminology, was female king. The most famous of the, of the female pharaohs, God, that was a tongue twister, wasn't it? As I'm sure you've all heard of, was Cleopatra, who was the last pharaoh of what we would call sort of the Egyptian dynasty. But the Egyptians did something kind of unusual with their pharaohs, and that was that a lot of the time they wore masculine clothes, regardless if they were male or female. And... The reason for this isn't 100% clear, but it's pretty widely acknowledged it was to do with bringing them closer to God. A really good example of this is the fake beard that all of the pharaohs would wear, basically, at certain times, particularly in religious occasions. And this beard is obviously quite a male signifier, so it's interesting that men would wear it as well. I have a couple of pictures here of a female pharaoh called Hatshepsut, that was, a, again, another mouthful. Um, he was basically being portrayed both without a beard, as here, and with a beard, here. By the way, can I just point out, I am loving this sort of magic of technology. It's fantastic. Um, oh, um, they were also, um, female pharaohs often painted yellow, which was basically the colour reserved for women, basically. Um, and they would have the beard on as well. So... Given that all male Egyptians at the time, at least in the upper classes, would have been clean-shaven anyway, as having a sort of natural beard was basically viewed for the lower and working classes, mm. putting this beard on becomes a kind of drag, doesn't it? Um, they put on a really obvious example of maleness to show that they were connected to their gods and that they were their representation on Earth. It's almost as if the beard, in this case, is a form of drag kinging, don't you think? And the beard itself doesn't even look natural as well. So it wasn't an attempt to look realistically like they've grown facial hair. It was woven and had super distinctive plaits on it as well. I've got a picture of Tutankhamun's mask um, there, and you can see exactly what I mean. So, all of the pharaohs have this very obviously fake beard strapped onto their chin to point out they were ruling Egypt at the time. So in that case, they were both a king in performance and over Egypt. No? Let me know, basically, what you think. Um, feel free to completely disagree with me on that, of course. We are going to be moving on, just because there's a lot to cover, like I said. And we're going to be moving on to Greek theatre now, which was happening around the same time, but we're looking at specific 600 BC to 400-ish BC, so about two and a half thousand years ago. Um, when 
theatre, basically, as we now know theatre as a modern audience, um, first came about, it was through these ancient Greek festivals, the Dionysus. Dionysus, for those that don't know, was the Greek god, and this is fabulous, by the way, the Greek god of winemaking, partying, theatre, pleasure, hedonism, and sexuality. He was basically the OG drag queen. Mm. Um, so, uh, I've lost my place now. Um, he was also what we'd probably call gender fluid nowadays, though. Um, he basically kind of shifted between sort of an old man with a beard or this sort of youthful, quite sort of uh, generic bodied male, um, but with quite long hair. Um, basically, in gay terms, he was either a daddy or a twink, depending on his mood, but basically he got wasted, had lots of sex and caused a general mayhem. It was kind of like his shtick. Anyway, when these festivals started in the 6th century BC, um, women and men would perform in what we would now call theatre productions. But at some point in the 5th century, women just kind of disappeared from the acting canon. But of course, female characters still existed. So with that, men had to step in to play the role of women. But they also had to, for some reason, make it super clear who were men and who were women, because apparently audiences couldn't tell the difference or something at the time. I won't know. So costumes were used to indicate the gender of characters on stage. Masks were super common examples here, and I've got a couple of images, there we are, to show you. And both of these ones happen to have beards. Um, the one on the bottom is obviously a mosaic, um, and the one on the top is an actual mask. Um, and those both represent men here. There were a couple of other examples. Um, uh, sorry, I'm looking at comments, I'm getting distracted now, I'm going to not look at that. There were another couple of examples of how drag was used to represent gender. There was, I'm going to butcher these names, and I'm really sorry if there's anyone Greek um, watching, because you're, you're going to want to just turn off. Dikothornus um, was basically a high-heeled boot that was used to make the actor walk like a woman. They were essentially high heels. There were female masks as well, um, although I'm showing you male here. They had longer hair, um, but the actors also would wear a shorter tunic, because apparently we need to objectify women even when they're played by men even thousands of years ago. Right? Um, there was something called a prostoridion, which was padding for a male actor's um, chest. Um, that helped a man look like a woman. And there was also something called a progestridius, which was padding for the belly, basically, to look like you're pregnant. Um, in comedies, it was pretty common for a male character to basically wear an absolutely enormous, massive false penis as well, just in case we weren't clear. And even in things like Lysistrata, the role of a nude girl called Peace was played quite literally by a man having a sign saying, Peace, a nude girl. Inventive, I know. But what I'm trying to get at here is drag was basically used by men to portray both men and women on the stage in this case. Even animals, when portrayed by men, weren't free from this weird yoke of gender. And I have a vase to show you here from a scene from Aristophanes' The Birds, um, which has no connection to the Hitchcock film. Um, interesting tidbit, this play is what um, sort of spawned the phrase Cloud Cuckoo Land. Um, and anyway, it looks kind of nuts from this image, so I can't honestly say I'm surprised. But if you have a look, the birds on either side, well, they're quite clearly men, aren't they? And some have argued at the end of the day, these performances were essentially drag shows with ribaldry and sexual innuendos and puns. One academic um, describes Lysistrata, which by the way is hilarious, um, is a Greek comedy about women withholding sex from their husbands to get their own way, and also by Aristophanes, the guy who wrote this, as I'm quoting here. A male drag show with burlesque jokes about breasts and phalluses played within the drag tradition which, looking at an illustration I've got here from an 1896 production, there's a lot going on there. I'll let you look at that and try and figure out as I go through. Um, what I'm going to do now, though, again, moving on quickly, is um, I'm going I'm to get rid of that. <laughs> a bit distracting. Um, uh, is basically we're going to go to the medieval period. Um, and the medieval period ran from 500 to 1500 um, AD. So we're looking at about 1,500 years ago to about... 500 years ago now. So it's kind of a big time frame and there's a lot to cover in it. Um, I will however very briefly touch on a couple of instances here and there that might be of interest to some people and you might want to listen back afterwards 
um, to make a note and look up some of these stories if you're interested. So, first of all, 5th century um, AD, we have a Saint Euphrosine of Alexandria, a daughter of a wealthy man who wasn't allowed to be a monk, so dressed up as a knight to convince some monks to let her in, and she lived her life in a monastery. We're going to move on to Kwa Mulan from the 4th to the 6th century, and it's a legendary story, this, but probably you best know this story from the Disney film, Mulan. Yeah, yeah, and there's another one coming out soon as well. Basically, she dressed up as a man to take her father's place in war. And in the legend, she spends um, 12 years in male clothes, actually, um, before returning home and revealing to her, like, her old comrades who she was, and they're all kind of really shocked about it. But even the Disney film makes a kind of joke about this. Um, they're turning, like, daughters into sons, don't they? Um, through that song, um, I'll make a man out of you, and all that lot. I can't sing. I won't do that again, I promise. Um, we also have Joan of Arc, yay, who was um, lived from 1412 to 1431. Now, basically, she wore men's armour and led the French armies to victory in the Hundred Years' War. Um, like I said, she wore men's clothing into battle, but I do feel like that's probably because it was more of a case of that or no clothing into battle. Um, we also have Elizabeth I, okay? So not quite medieval, but close enough, and there's probably some medievalists who are now going to shout at me later. Um, and although realistically she never wore men's clothes, she often betrayed herself as quite masculine. Um, and it's argued that she sort of happily allowed stories of her in male clothes to circulate. Um, she's probably the closest companion we have to the female pharaohs I mentioned above. And many argue she adopted this role of like female king rather than queen. Um, for example, there's a suggestion she wore men's armour, as you can see from this picture, which is quite similar, like I said, to this Joan of Arc picture there. You can probably see the similarities. Um, but there's something called the Tilbury speech when we're leading against the Armada, and she says, I know I have the body but of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too. Oh. Um, so lots of these, as you can tell, are basically women dressing up as men um, to do, like, war basically. Well, there was a couple of religious ones as well. We have Pope Joan from 855 to 857 AD, and again, probably fictional, but the story goes she would dress up as a man at the behest of a lover, um, was pretty convincing, worked her way up through the church and ended up as Pope. I mean, that is... Um, I've got a question. Um, the medieval Pope story is um, apocryphal. It's kind of rumoured on and off. I just saw that question pop up. Um, it's debatable, probably not realistically, but it was an extremely popular story. Um, anyway, she was discovered, as it were, um, basically when she gave birth during a procession, <laughs> which just really makes me laugh. Like she just, oh, oh hang on a minute. I'm just going to just drop that down. <laughs> Um, and finally, finally in the medieval period, because I am moving quickly, I know, to swing back a little bit to possibly my favourite story from this period of time. Around the year 1396, a guy called Henry Knighton, who was an Augustinian monk, wrote a history of England from the Norman conquest until the time he died. Um, and in this, he basically said that in the year 1348, a group of... Um, 40 to 50 women, basically, started attending tournaments in men's clothes and behaving in an inappropriate manner, which basically meant they were carrying weapons, generally causing mischief and <gasps> spending money. Oh, awful. Anyway, according to Knighton, God didn't like this, so sent a storm to disrupt the festivities, and then shortly after, sent the Black Death across Europe to punish England and all the others for their sins. I should hope it can be left unsaid that these women and men's clothes did not cause the Black Death, but I do kind of like the idea that, like, um, a group of women caused enough mischief to annoy God enough to just send this plague. Um, and I kind of think, like, am I to blame for what's happening now? Ah, but no. Anyway, um, moving on again, we're now going to go to Shakespeare. Woo! Now, everyone's heard of Shakespeare. Are you all following? Are you all still with me? I'm going to take a quick drink. Um, whew. Right. Everyone's heard of Shakespeare, and as I imagine, most of you are probably aware 
that in the same way as Greek theatre before, women weren't really allowed on stage, at least not until the Reformation in 1660. Um, there's going to be someone, I know there's a Shakespearean scholar in here, and, and I know he's going to be like, you're wrong or something here. But basically, men played women um, once again, and often the younger cast members, who still look quite feminine in their features, um, were the ones to play that. Um, I, this, for example, um, is a cover from Twelfth Night, which is one of the most well-known of the uh, Shakespeare plays with cross-dressing. Um, there's also As You Like It, The Merchant of Venice, and there's probably a few others that I've got completely forgotten off the top of my head. But what I kind of want to point out here is while the script basically says this is a female character, and that's that, on stage we have a completely different visual. We basically have one of a young man playing a young woman in disguise as a young man, often cause of confusion amongst other young men and other women who are also young male actors. And basically there's a lot of gender confusion basically taking place on stage and a lot of comedy associated with that. And it's kind of hard to not see Shakespeare playing with this on stage. And a lot of the comedy is drawn on the drag that takes place and it complicates things. And this has contributed to the debate whether Shakespeare was gay or bisexual, as the potential for homoeroticism, basically, was really powerful throughout the whole lot. Um, that whole gay-bisexual debate is a whole other debate I'm not going to get into um, right now, um, but, I mean, there's plenty written on it. We are also approaching a sort of chronological, chron a tradition chronologically, oh, have got that in the end, here, where men dressing as women are becoming more and more common in the sort of stories being told. This is also, from a retrospective point of view, um, where the strongly contested terminology of drag, I can get that so you can see me, drag, um, comes from. Um, it's one of the questions that comes up, why, why drag? Why is that the word that we use? Um, particularly as its first recorded usage was in reference to cross-dressing, was in 1870. However, it's kind of most commonly acknowledged um, origin of the word. It, it harks back to this sort of time where theatre was becoming more and more popular, um, particularly throughout Shakespeare's era, and this tradition of men playing women. And the general argument goes that the long dresses, petticoats and sleeves that the men wore um, basically dragged along the floor. Um, this picture here, by the way, I've got right here, is um, it's just a reproduction, but it's just to give you an idea of the kind of outfit they might um, have been wearing. Um, anyway, it wasn't just on stage, though, um, that these stories were coming. Um, and as time develops, more and more histories of, in these cases, men um, coming wearing feminine clothes off stage were increasing. Which brings me nicely to the Molly Houses in London in the 1700s, 1800s. So, despite me talking about at the beginning that a lot of terms are contentious when placed historically, I'm now going to talk about what one academic calls the first drag queen in England, a gentleman named John Cooper, um, who was a servant who also went by a female persona called Princess Seraphina. Um, oh, I've got one. Oh, wow, interesting comment. We'll come back to that. Um, so, to set the scene here, um, in England at the time, more and more people were starting to explore um, drag and cross-dressing um, through these masquerades, these weekly masquerades that were hugely popular in London. And they would attract like, up to 800 people at a time. Um, and they allowed people to kind of swap and sort of play with gender, um, even if just for the night. These disguises, of course, allowed a lot of clandestine meeting to take place, particularly amongst gay men. If one was in disguise, then it was easier to get away with meeting other men, and it may have even provided some sort of plausible deniability, basically, if it was needed. A lot of these very same gay men who attended these masquerades also frequented what were called molly houses. Now, a mole was basically a term from an effeminate gay man, um, and they were basically the meeting places for these primarily gay men. They were essentially the first gay bars in England. And it's important to note here, however, there is a coalescence here, and I said I'd point these out when they come up, um, or where drag and trans and gay male culture all sorts sort of merging around here. And I'm not going to delve too deep into it right now, um, but there is, it's worth bearing this in mind throughout the sort of following discussion. Anyway, these uh, molly houses sat in what was 
basically the equivalent of the Soho district, um, which is actually in um, Hoburn, um, a place called Field Lane in the surrounding areas. And the most famous of these houses was run by someone called Mother Clapp, who was a female bar lady who was actually known as Margaret Clapp. Um, you basically found a demographic worth serving and ran with it. <laughs> um, another particularly famous one <laughs> was run by a Miss Muff, um, who was actually the unfortunately named Jonathan Muff in day-to-day -day life. Um, and that now stands at 45 Whitechapel Road, although obviously not in the same form. Most of the information we have on Molly Houses unfortunately comes from raids from the police were basically attempting to arrest men for, and I quote, the, de the detestable sin of sodomy. The most famous of which being a raid on um, Mother Clapp's house, which ended up with three men unfortunately being hanged for being sodomites. Miss Muff's Molly house was also raided during a private drag party, um, and nine male ladies were arrested. We know what happened to six of them. Two of them were whipped, one was fined, two were acquitted, and one, called Thomas Mitchell, um, attempted to take his own life in prison, but was unsuccessful and his life was preserved by, um, at the point of death, by two nearby surgeons, so doctors basically at the time. Clearly, being at the Molly Houses was extremely risky, yet they proliferated. The, um, the extract I've just brought up here is uh, an, a contemporary newspaper article, and they call them Women Haters Lamentation. Um, and if I can lean in, it's, it's um, they're accused for the unnatural despising of the fair sex and um, intriguing with one another. So basically for interacting. And it's basically sensationalising these men that took their own life um, after being arrested. Um, it's horrible, basically. I'm going to move that image on. Um, but like I said, they were these proliferated despite these risks. Um, to give an idea of how many houses there were, um, there were legal investigations into 30 Molly houses in the 1700s. Um, and there's no doubt many that were investigated as well. But given the size of the population of London at the time, just a dozen of those houses were approximately the equivalent to over 200 gay bars in London in the 1970s. In short, there was this absolutely massive subculture surrounding drag, cross-dressing and molly houses that was as big and prolific as any modern gay subculture that we've got. Princess Serafina was one of these regular molly house patrons, despite the risks of attending, and was well known on the scene, as it were, as her and other molls would meet up, and they all had these equally fabulous names, um, quite similar to current drag queens, actually. And, and these are real names I'm about to list off. We have Plump Nelly, Primrose Mary, Aunt May, Aunt England, the Duchess of Chamomile, which I quite like, Princess Serafina herself, and my favourite, Susan Guzzle. Serafina, however, was the most famous and adopted this identity in her real life. Um, and no one seemed to mind either, interestingly, with the exception of one cousin who thought she was scandalous and, oh, well, who cares? Um, but given that her behaviour was technically illegal at the time, as a cross-dresser was essentially viewed as a sodomite, and as I've already said, we know that they were often hanged, the only time she was in court was when she took someone else to court for nicking her dresses. Um, which makes me wish that my dresses were good enough to be nicked, by the way, because this course is hanging off me and I could do with a better set. Who knows, one day I'll see you all in court, maybe. Unfortunately, um, Princess Serafina lost this case. Right. Now, moving on to the 1800s and all the way to the early mid-1900s and the reintroduction of the stage when I'm talking about drag. I'm going to talk about the burlesque and vaudevillian scenes of the 1800s and these all had a particularly large stake in drag um, and they reflected a growing interest in the cabaret styles of performance that were growing in popularity across um, Europe, particularly in Berlin at the time. Um, and there's a huge amount of history on like the cabaret performance in mainland Europe. Um, and if you're interested keep, um, in some of the key areas about this, um, Robert Beachy wrote a book called Gay Berlin. Um, you can have a look at that. And that's quite interesting. It talks about this sort of queer scene being formed. But also, quite interestingly, um, the first use of the term homosexual and the rise of that as a term um, within queer culture. Um, however, to go back to England, um, there was a massive interest in these male or female um, impersonators, they were called at the time. 
um, on the vaudeville cabaret scene, which were known as variety shows at the time. Um, on the musical, one part of the performance that was particularly appreciated um, was basically uh, this idea that the performer convincingly portrays um, or passes as the opposite gender until the big reveal at the end. And both men and women impersonated the opposite gender in these shows. And a famous example of this is uh, Julian Eltinge, who perform as a woman until the very end and then shock his audiences with the reveal by removing his wig. I'm not going to do that. You don't want to see what it looks like under here. Um, anyway, um, this style of cabaret variety show still exists today, and you often see it at drag bars, with often drag kings in this case, often acting as cabaret hosts. Um, Eltinge, however, was super successful until about the 30s, and then basically all of these acts started falling out of favour. And it's only a really few queens that had any real success in the few decades after World War II, um, from the 30s until several decades after World War II. And some of them you'll know is uh, Danny LaRue, Dame Edna Everidge, um, Divine over in the US. Pantomime characters also built on this idea of cross-dressing though, and pantomime became more and more popular in the 1800s, and more and more frequently there was drag taking place in the swapping of gender roles on stage, something that we still carry on today. Plucked from the music halls, the principal boy was often played by a young woman in breeches part. Some early original boys can be seen here. Um, and I've got here, um, again, Magic of Technology, hopefully this will work. Oh, oh, oh there, we, there we are. Here we have um, Rosie St. George as Boy Blue in Bo Peep. We have Maud Boyd in Robin Hood. And we have Ada Blanche over here in Robinson Crusoe. And all of these pictures are from 1893. Meanwhile, the pantomime dame has been a fixture since the beginning of the 1800s. And we have, for example, um, Mother Goose, played in this image here, the one nearest to me, played by a Mr. Simmons, as you can see, and this was in 1806. And we also have here, quite famously, the first Widow Twanky um, as Dan Leno. Was he the first? A famous Widow Twanky. <laughs> However, with the dame in particular, this sort of cross-dressing was ex always explicitly part of the humour, and no matter how well disguised the actor was, it was always revealed it was essentially a man in drag to the audience. The typical Dane humour we expect in a modern pantomime um, has also continued from this very beginning, um, with Widow Twanky being a famous example from Aladdin, where he first started in 1861 at the Strand, um, and is named after basically Twanky T. Um, which was basically a knockoff cheap tea that no real tea drinker would ever drink. Um, think more like Tesco value than M&S tea kind of thing. Um, and it was especially funny because this was obviously a woman that no one would ever actually really want to date from the audience's perception because obviously it's a man in drag. And there's this ongoing humour between the love interest of the dame, the character of the dame itself, and this sort of dramatic irony, um, as in what the audience know that the characters don't, um, that plays with comedy in the same way that Shakespeare did. Um, and basically these were extremely popular. I actually have here an illustration from a newspaper um, from one of the pantomimes um, at the end of the uh, 1800s. I think it was 1896 again, I might be mistaken though. And this is basically an illustration from Sleeping Beauty and the Beast, um, which is when they combine yeah, Sleeping Beauty and Beauty and the Beast. Um, it has an enormous cast, as you can see. That's a cave scene there. And um, this particular one went on for five hours. So clearly these principal boys and dames had to be super good, basically, at what they did to maintain the audience's interest over this like sea of people over this amount of time. Um, and basically they were experts at it. And that's kind of what's helped cement what we have in Britain as the pantomime tradition. Right. I'm going to scoot on forward quickly again um, to uh, the 60s now um, and start focusing on the role drag and trans people had in possibly the most important event in queer history. And this is another event where drag and trans history sort of coalesce. Um, so although I mentioned there were a few successful drag performers, it's important to note, um, however, how few and far between they were. And many non-gender conforming people were hugely impressed in society at this time. 
This came to a head in particular in 1969 at the Stonewall Inn through something we now call the Stonewall Riots. In June 28th, a group of LGDB, LGBT plus people, well that's an alpha again, resisted a police raid on the Stonewall Inn in New, in New York in the United States and sparked basically the first real act of collective resistance against the widespread oppression of the LGBT community. Now, I want to point out here there have been many retellings of the Stonewall riots. It's one of those things where everyone at the time said they were there, and um, like 3,000 people were there, and there was only 200 or something. Um, and there's simply just not one definitive story that comes from it. Um, although people have tried to tell this story, such as um, in the film Stonewall from 2015. However, testimony at the time um, from people who were there, who would say they were there, shows us that there were all types of people there which included young people, drag artists, trans people, lesbian separatists, and people from all of the parts of the LGBT spectrum. What I want to highlight here, however, is across this huge community in the LGBT um, sort of community, what was most important was they were all in it together. Three of the most famous veterans from the riots themselves highlight this breadth of community. We have, um, and I've got two people here, we have the person nearest to me, which was self-identified black drag queen Marsha P. Johnson. Next to her in this picture, we have a gender-fluid trans Latina woman, Sylvia Rivera. And there was also mixed-race drag queen, lesbian bouncer and self-proclaimed babysitter of my people, Storm de la Ville, who was reputed, actually, to being the first person to throw the punch at Stonewall after a police officer who mistook her for a man because she was in male clothes at the time told her to, and I'm quoting here, move along, faggot. Either way, the Stonewall riots were the catalyst of queer activism worldwide, and it's almost impossible to understate just both how important this event was, but also the breadth of community that were present there, including drag queens and trans people. This level of political and social activism, however, sparked by Stonewall, has carried on ever since, and drag queens have often been at the vanguard of these movements. I'll only focus on one group in this talk, um, but there have been literally hundreds, if not thousands, of movements that drag queens have been part of. And the one I particularly want to look at is a group known as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, who modelled themselves on the structures of a nunnery and have branches all around the world. Their everlasting mission statement is, and I quote, to promulgate universal joy and expiate stigmatic guilt. And it's open to all genders and all sexualities, as long as you feel the call of the habit. Founded in 1979, and by the way, this is my favourite story ever of any charity founding. Founded in 1979 by Hysterectoria Agnes, Reverend Mother Missionary Position, <laughs> and Sister Vicious Power Hungry Bitch, after reusing some habits that they borrowed and forgot to return to some Roman Catholic nuns that they used for a production of A Sound of Music in 1976, they've since started working um, and raising money and advocating for aid support, safer sex campaigns, awareness around drug use, homeless LGBT people, and they basically raise thousands and thousands of dollars a year. Please do look for other movements though as well. I don't want to sit here and be like, this is the one to look at. Um, but there's lots to pick from, and I just kind of wanted to highlight this as the kind of things that drag activism is doing. We're nearing the end of the Whistle Stop Tour now, which is good because my throat's getting sore. Um, I want to bring you basically now to an area that the rise of drag, as it were, um, particularly the ballroom, voguing, and Paris is burning. So if any of you have seen the series Pose, um, you'll be familiar with the kind of ballroom scene that I'm talking about here. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend all of you watch Paris is Burning whilst you have the time in lockdown. There's no excuses, it's on Netflix. It betrays the bull culture of New York in the 80s, where drag performers would walk the floor in categories for trophies. Nearly exclusively poor gay men and trans women of colour, the bulls allowed people to drag up and play the role they wish they could attain in reality outside the ballroom walls. Men playing men, women playing women, and men playing women in all forms of drag, from dressing and behaving to Wall Street bankers, to military sergeants, to women in evening ball gowns. Um, drag allowed the attendees at the ball a space to express themselves in the relative safety of the outside. 
I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I am happy to talk about this in the q and if people are interested. Um, particularly about the roles of families and drag houses, which I've done some research on. But what I want to mention here, particularly, is quite how influential the film in this scene was on the modern drag scene. To give an example of its impact today, I literally don't remember the last time I saw a RuPaul's Drag Race episode that didn't in some way reference either the scene or Paris is Burning in some form or another, either explicitly or implicitly. Um, and this film was the one that brought it to a global audience, along with Voguing, which was a type of dance at the balls. Um, watch the, watch the uh, documentary if you want a much more in-depth explanation of Voguing if you haven't heard of it. And it was relatively unheard of, basically, though, until Madonna released her single, Vogue, where she drew heavily on the ballroom dance. It's a dance style that is designed to emulate the poses held in fashion magazines such as Vogue, and it's almost instantly recognisable. And it was a staple of the drag community. Madonna, obviously a multi-million selling artist, brought this style of dance to a massive community outside the drag scene, which brings me to the very final part of my talk, the great globalisation of drag. Basically, since the 90s, there's been this massive explosion and proliferation of media and the ways to consume portrayals of drag. There's been a significant role in how drag is consumed around the world, but also produced with new portrayals of drag coming out all the time and old portrayals of drag being circulated much more easily. Sitting down and making a list of examples um, for this talk about drag and like popular drag and how it's been more spread throughout um, the 90s and onwards, I was able to come up with this list in less than a minute. We have Le Cage Fall, Mrs. Doubtfire, Hairspray, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, Kinky Boots, Lady Gaga as a drag king personality, Joe Calderoni, AJ and the Queen, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, The Boulet Brothers' Dragula, Pose, which I mentioned above, Everybody Loves Jamie, The Rocky Horror Show, obviously, and Conchita Verse at the Eurovision Drag Contest. What I'm trying to say here is that drag is no longer close to the small bars and hidden rooms, nor to the stage and theatrical performance, but instead it's sort of been blasted open, basically, to mainstream community, and it's gaining speed consistently. This very broadcast here is an example of this, and the internet has increased this access to a whole new range of people, and for drag, kings, queens, drag performers. There are now Instagram queens, there are Instagram queens, Instagram kings, for example, and there are whole new movements that once would remain completely hidden that are now much more well known, such as those that are looking if you can do genderless drag and investigating what that might look at, which is actually something else I research as well. There's even whole shows now where performers of all and no gender present performers that draw on the history of drag um, in this variety show of cabaret and gender bending performances, such as Sasha Velour's Nightgowns. And she's also someone particularly interested. She was um, in season nine of RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes, nine, I'm trying to remember. Um, and she is something who's super interesting to look at and see the kinds of things she does in terms of gender bending. Even as I was writing this, the end bit here, queens from RuPaul Drag Race are using Facebook Live, like me here, um, to circulate a fundraiser for local queens who have lost income from performing in bars called Work the World Tour. The internet itself has opened up this whole new world of drag, both in terms of audience and performers. Um, many of you listening today just simply wouldn't have had the opportunity without the internet and the opportunities it affords. Some people have called basically the time that we're living in the golden age of drag. What I would argue instead is that this is the age of drag proliferation. And actually, there hasn't been a single golden age of drag. But instead, this sort of constantly fluid, yet rich, beautiful and incredible history of drag. And hopefully you found something worthwhile hearing in this talk. Thank you. Right, let me centre that there. I am going to go and see if I can find comments to look at. Oh, there were 33 comments. What do they all say? If I can actually look at them. Bear with me. Feel free to comment, by the way, um, if you want. Um, I am going to do my best to see what the comments are. Ah, so, any questions? Um, Nick, you're not meant to be watching. Hello, everyone. Hello, Christian. Hello, Jack. Hello, Megan. Thank you. Hello, Jay. 
People are applauding. Hello, Emily and Jana, Roxanne, uh, Damien. There's loads. Um, I am magic. I love it. How was the beard attached? Um, so I'm assuming this is the beard attached basically around uh, the pharaohs. It was actually with a cord um, to answer that question. I, I don't know why I didn't mention that, but it was attached with a cord. Um, oh no, comments. Comments are disappearing and I was watching them. There we are. Um, right. Um, Liam, um, I knew it was your fault. Yes, thank you, Caroline. I caused coronavirus, of course. Um, Liam is right in terms of ancient Rome. Um, sexuality was defined as either bottoms or tops. These sorts of definitions didn't exist. And that's actually a really good example of, oh, my wig's falling apart, of how these um, sorts of time, it really is, isn't it? How these sorts of time frames um, had different definitions entirely um, as they went through. Um, right, there was a couple of questions. If you had a time machine, when and why? Where would I go? Where would I go? <gasps> well, um, mm, that's a tough question. Um, I think there would be... Uh, it sounds really bad. I would really love to go back and see the Molly houses um, in the 1700s. I know it wasn't a good time, basically. I know it was um, a rough time of to be gay, a rough time to sort of do anything like drag. Um, I would absolutely love to go back and just see what these were like, these very first scenes of queer culture. I think it would just be absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Um, I hope I've answered that. Um, what other questions? When did links to the quick disabled community begin? Well, that's an interesting question. It's not something I actually know a huge amount about. Um, there is someone I know, and I don't know if they're watching today, who would know much more about that, and I think might have even written about it. Um, it's an academic called Kate Stoko. Um, hi, Kate, if you're watching. If not, go check them out. They're amazing. Um, but um, there's always been this sort of history in terms of um, at least marginalised or bodies that are viewed as um, broken or different. And again, I use that very heavy quotation. Um, one example would be in the ballroom scenes, um, actually, thinking about it. Um, there's a category called sex siren. Um, and I saw this basically in Berlin. I went to a, a, um, a, 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 a ball, a ball. Um, in Berlin, it was amazing, and they had um, all the very old traditional categories, and Sex Siren was basically, um, it was one of the few women were not allowed to film, they would have kicked you out if you had, and it basically was people walking down the ballroom runway, wearing nothing, basically, and that originally, from my understanding, originally transpired from people who had these, um, again, broken bodies, and often it was trans people in this case, or people who um, didn't fit in, as it were, um, and it was an attempt to be like a reclamation of their body and be like, no, um, damn well, this is like, you know, I am sexy. This is what I can do. You don't get to judge my body. I can reclaim this power to me. And not only that, everyone in this room is allowing that. And again, that was a very specific space in the ballroom that allowed that sort of opportunity that was just didn't exist outside. Um, unfortunately, I don't know much more in terms of the direct links between, um, drag and um, disability and crip theory. Um, I would, like I said, point out going towards academics. There is definitely writing on that. So sorry, I don't know much more about that. Let me swing back and ask a couple of other questions. Now let me see what other questions are. Do, where do drag artists learn how to do their makeup or is it just experimentation? Oh, good question. Um, in the past, traditionally, um, Someone who was looking at doing drag was taken on by a drag parent, a drag mother or a drag father. And this is when you get these houses. Um, if you watch Pose, you know, um, one of the big things that come up is the rivalry between houses. Um, it's the house of um, Ella Extravagance. Um, and I'm trying to think um, um, of the other one. I think it might be Opulence. Oh, I'm going to kick myself. I watched it only the other day. Um, Traditionally, a drag mother would sit there and sort of coach um, a, a queen through their first uh, drag performance. Um, through makeup, through um, a whole lot, basically. And that's how they would learn. 
nowadays, again, given this hugely sort of prolific difference coming up um, in terms of the way drag is consumed, a lot of it is um, a mixture of experimentation and often things like YouTube. There's a lot of guides online. So when I did um, looking at, uh, when I did my makeup, and I'm still, I'm still learning, I'm no way am I going to say I'm an expert in makeup. I did a lot of experimentation and I did a huge amount of looking online and seeing what worked. Um, I saw some drag looks that I sort of like pinch bits for me, like, oh, I really like how that looks. And I do it myself and I was like, oh my God, that looks awful. Like, it looks horrific. Um, so I've, I've kind of been doing that. I've also been gradually, gradually finding more and more my style and how I do that. Um, basically, it depends. Um, the drag families are less popular now, but they definitely still do exist and there are big cultures around that. To go back to that ballroom that I mentioned I saw in Berlin, there were several houses there um, that were doing a lot. There was House of Army, there was House of Juicy. There, um, and th th these families came from like Poland and stuff. When I was in Berlin, there were local um, uh, Berlin houses. Like, they were everywhere and they do exist. Um, although probably not in quite the same style that we do now. But that's how basically makeup came about. Are there any examples of mimicry of other genders in non-human animal kingdom? Are these of mimicry? Oh, I see. Um, that's an interesting question. This is um, another Liam that asked the question. Um, I don't know is the short answer. Um, I'm really sorry. I, I, I would be educated guessing. Um, my immediate thought, and this is entirely just off the top of my head, would be probably not... Um, in terms of viewing it through that specific sort of theoretical lens, only because drag is te generally viewed in terms of like the socials and humanities and arts, whereas I imagine there's more this sort of looking there in terms of, um, we're talking in terms of like specific mimicry, more of the, the hard science. But again, that, that's just me speculating. I'm really sorry, I just don't know more than that. I, I should, that's a really interesting question actually. Despite clear links, is there a rivalry between drag and trans communities? Yes. Um, basically, um, I've just seen it pop up, by the way, and I would, I would emphasise this. Um, do watch um, Dumpling. It's good. Um, but to go back, is there a rivalry? Yes. Um, in short, there is. Um, not everywhere. Not everyone. But I would be lying if I said there's nothing. Part of that, I think, has come from... Um, several places, one of which I think comes from the idea that drag and trans history has sort of coalesced and blurred, um, which uh, basically is partly an issue of basically white gay men taking the norm over everything, um, but also partly because there just, just wasn't that language at the time. Um, so trans got merged into drag, drag got merged into trans, I've tried to sort of pick that apart as I've gone through here. Um, there's also been arguments as well about um, the, the adoption of gender that drag does. Drag is putting on, um, at least in a superficial way, an element of gender in the way I have here, for example. Um, whereas with trans, obviously, that's not really the case. Um, the short answer is it's complicated. Um, but what I kind of want to emphasise as well is there's also a massive amount of... Um, affiliation and community between trans and drag um, as well. Often when you see drag done, it can be done in quite nasty ways. You might see, for example, um, a sports team going out and getting drunk and dressing up as women and being like, yeah, I'm a woman. And then, and, and then you know, that then gets mixed up with, oh, and it gets quite misogynistic and trans misogynistic and so on. And, and that's, for me, that I wouldn't view that as drag. I think that's not there. I have a really strong um, sort of uh, a view that we should be trying to build communities when these sorts of fractures happen and they never to be happening in any community. Um, yes, there has been, was the short answer. Um, oh, did you say the popularity of RuPaul's Drag Race is specifically like the success of people in Jeffrey Chuck? Yes, in short. Um, I don't have much more to add than that. Yes. Um, it's become more accepted. Men doing fabulous, glamorous, over-the-top makeup. I mean, I was following Jeffree Star when I was about 13, and Jeffree Star's always done makeup like that. Like, when, like, MySpace Jeffree Star with the big hair, 
um, you know, and before he even did makeup, he did god awful music, um, which I used to listen to. Oh, god, memories. Um, but yes, in short, it has. He was like, at the time, he was, when he first came out, he was really sort of like controversial. He was a big MySpace character, partially because of just how shocking he was um, in terms of the way he looked. Um, whereas uh, it's not really that shocking anymore. I mean, he's now a really successful businessman and he's gone um, gone on from there. So obviously there's been a shift. Um, I think RuPaul's Drag Race, not the only reason, but I think it's definitely played a massive part in that. Are there modern opportunities for women to take part in drag? Yes, 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 yes. Drag is not men doing women. It's not just that. There's so much more. Um, and I think uh, it's often overlooked. Um, when um, there was a competition at the Yard, which is the local gay bar in Coventry where I'm based, um, there, and they had, um, in one show, they had, um, cut the drag queens, they had a drag king, they had a woman doing drag queening. The week after they had um, a trans man, they had um, a trans woman, a gender fluid, like, you know, yeah, any, anyone, anyone of any gender can do drag. They're just absolutely like, do it. If you want to do it, do it, do it. There's actually, actually, this is quite interesting. There's a story um, of drag king workshops that used to take place. Um, and basically, this was in the 90s, and I think it was in New York, but they sort of travelled it around a bit. And women used to go um, to these workshops, and in the morning, they would spend the whole morning drag-kinging up, but convincing, very convincing, they would pass, as it were, as men. And then in the afternoons, they would then basically hit the town into the late evening. And because they looked realistically um, as men, and again, I'm using all this in quotation marks, please insert where appropriate, um, they would basically adopt this character, and there's the research on this um, after said they all adopted these characters of these kind of like louty dudes who were like, Whoa, like drinking and doing all of this stuff, um, because they were given the opportunity they weren't able to have otherwise um, as women. Um, I think that's just one example, but I think drag can give people, anyone, an opportunity to sort of learn ways of expressing themselves. Um, and how and why they want to do that can be their own reasons. Um, but I think, yeah, absolutely, anyone and everyone um, should be able to do drag. Um, should Nina Benina Brown should have played Black China? No. No, she shouldn't. She'd have been awful. <laughs> Sorry. Nah, not Black China. Um, <laughs> with that, it has reached eight o'clock. I am going to run. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. It really means a lot that you've um, all come in and, and watched. And um, what I would ask is anyone who's watched, um, I'd really, 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 really appreciate um, any feedback you have. Drop a message to the Queer History Warwick page. Um, any of you, um, positive, negative, constructive, try not to be destructive. Um, feedback about this because one of the things I'm wanting to do is take this um, this talk and adapt it for schools and go into schools and sort of talk about gender and queer history in schools um, so anything along those lines would be super super handy and I said whilst you're at it um, do give queer history Warwick um, a, a like I just want to say as well before I go um, thank you so much um, to Coventry Pride as well, um, and Dylan from Coventry. I don't know if he's still watching. He has done a huge amount for me in terms of just setting up all of this, the intro, the music, the little branding here. Fantastic, absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. And with that, I shall bid you adieu until next time. Mwah.